Over the past three decades, there have been literally hundreds of Final Fantasy games released, re-released, remastered, and remade. Some of these are now regarded amongst the best games of all time, while others have been there to keep the fanbase engaged or as a way of building out the ever-expanding universes of subseries such as Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy XV. But even though so many games have been released, there are still countless others that never got the chance. They were either cancelled during early stages of development as the idea was stress tested and found wanting, or much closer to the intended launch as problems were encountered that could never be resolved. Such instances almost always lead to a lot of discussion and speculation amongst members of the community about what unfinished projects may have looked like, and how they may have performed. Because while some of them may well have flopped, what if there was a hidden gem somewhere in there that just needed a bit more care and attention? It can therefore be fun to imagine what it would have been like to play a Final Fantasy game that doesn't exist, but could have. And that is why we wanted to go over every known cancelled Final Fantasy game, because there are plenty out there, and there may even be some that you may not have been aware of. So why not sit back and relax as we kick things off with a rather unorthodox game based around a fan favourite mascot, Chocobo the Battle. Chocobos are perhaps one of the most iconic creatures in the Final Fantasy franchise, appearing in nearly every single title under its umbrella. And as Square looked to explore how they could expand their portfolio of properties associated with Final Fantasy, creating games based around the adorable mascot made a lot of sense. It saw Square explore numerous ideas for games outside of their traditional genres, and one of the most intriguing experiments in this regard was meant to be a fighting game called Chocobo de Battle. The plan was for the game to be Square's first foray into the arcade gaming scene, with a PlayStation release also considered. And to go alongside with the notion of pushing into genres outside of the traditional, instead of it being a 2D or 3D fighting game like Street Fighter or Tekken, where specific characters square off against each other, the uniqueness of Chocobo de Battle was meant to come via players controlling characters who were riding Chocobos. And while few of the intended fighting commands and combos were ever revealed, some footage was shown that depicted a mechanic where Chocobos could fire missiles at one another. In terms of visual presentation, Chocobo de Battle employed a behind-the-camera view rather than a profile view seen in many other classic fighting games. But like most of its contemporaries, the roster was planned to contain a mixture of characters and chocobos. But amongst this already unusual concept, perhaps one of the most curious aspects of the game were its intended controls. As if it wasn't already bizarre enough, instead of using a standard stick and buttons, the arcade version of Chocobo de Battle was designed to operate using motion controls. This would have seen players move their hands over a blue motion sensing board using certain gestures to maneuver their characters and execute specific actions. Perhaps because of how ambitious this project was, Chocobo de Battle ended up being cancelled. When speaking to us, Hironobu Sakaguchi shared that the initial objective was to create a game that celebrated the impact of Chocobos, but after reaching a certain point in the game's development, they took stock and realised that the concept of Chocobos fighting against each other was perhaps not the best way to do that, especially since they don't even have arms. But even though the game never materialised, the notion of celebrating Chocobos did still manifest through games like Chocobos Dungeon and Chocobo Racing. Now, Chocobo Racing itself turned out to be a very competent kart racing game, and for many years there were calls for it to be franchised itself. Releasing in the late 90s, Chocobo Racing saw Square attempt to capitalise on the kart racing craze that was taking over due to the initial success of Super Mario Kart and subsequent games like Street Racer, Wacky Wheels and Diddy Kong Racing. The premise was very similar, but instead of Chocobo de Battle, or indeed the Chocobo Racing found in Final Fantasy VII, where players rode Chocobos, here, players selected from Final Fantasy mascots, classes and characters, and raced in more traditional modes of transport. This meant alongside Chocobos, players could also choose from a Moogle, Bahamut, and even Squall. The game itself was competent, and the issues people had, such as track design and controls, could have been ironed out with subsequent releases. But the game remained dormant for many years, 
That was until E3 2010, when Square Enix announced a new Chocobo Racing game called Chocobo Racing 3D that was set to be released for the Nintendo 3DS. There was a degree of excitement about this, but nothing more was ever learnt about the game. And in late 2013, Takashi Tokita, who directed the original Chocobo Racing, shared that the game had been cancelled. He revealed that the reason for the cancellation was that Chocobo Racing 3D was just not of a high enough quality to justify its release, and that it had been developed for the wrong demographic, adults instead of children. Tokita also, quite interestingly, shared that the project was being handled by someone else, but that if he had been put in charge, he would have made sure that it came out. A decade later, Chocobo Racing did then receive its long-awaited successor in the form of Chocobo GP. Togata was again not involved in a leadership capacity, and the game was panned upon launch for numerous reasons, with one being the overly aggressive monetization strategies Square Enix had chosen to employ. Compared to Final Fantasy 1 and 2, which have been remade and re-released countless times, Final Fantasy 3 can sometimes feel quite isolated, but that wasn't meant to be the case. Despite releasing numerous high-profile video games throughout the late 90s, Square had been crippled from a financial perspective by the dismal box office performance of The Spirits Within. To try and turn the fortunes of the business around, additional revenue streams were explored, and it was for this reason that Square entered into a dialogue with Bandai about porting older Final Fantasy games to their upcoming handheld console, the Wonderswan Color. After numerous discussions, Square then signed a deal that saw them commit to releasing their three 8-bit Final Fantasy games on the upcoming system, and they were planned to be remade from the ground up to take advantage of the system's capabilities. The original Final Fantasy subsequently released as a launch title on the 9th of December 2000, with Final Fantasy II then releasing a year after. Due to their success, the deal was then expanded, and Final Fantasy IV was re-released on the Wonderswan Color towards the start of 2002, but the remade version of Final Fantasy III never materialised. According to reports, the game was in a playable state, but Square had delayed publishing the game for undisclosed reasons. Towards the start of 2003, it was then rumoured that Bandai had even purchased the rights to publish the game themselves. But as production of the Wonderswan Color had ceased by this point, with the handheld system having not managed to perform well enough against Nintendo's offerings, Bandai also decided not to push forward. Hiromichi Tanaka later shared that whereas remaking the first two Final Fantasy games, and indeed Final Fantasy IV, was quite straightforward, replicating the process for Final Fantasy III was not. The issues came from how much content was crammed into the original game. When Final Fantasy III was produced for the Famicom, the team had stretched the memory allocation to the absolute limit. Every single one of those audio and visual assets was then needed to be recreated for the Wonderswan Color version. If they wanted to keep everything consistent across Final Fantasy 1, 2 and 3, there just wasn't enough storage capacity for them to make that a reality. Even if there was though, the other challenge was around manpower as they would have had to assign people to recreate those assets, and there just weren't enough people available. Final Fantasy III then suffered a similar fate when it was considered for re-release on the Game Boy Advance. Every single 8-bit and 16-bit Final Fantasy ended up being released on the Game Boy Advance, the only exceptions being Final Fantasy III and Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. But even though work was complete on Final Fantasy III Advance, just like it was complete on the Wonderswan Color version, similar problems were encountered, and the game ended up being cancelled. After suffering from years of development hell, Square Enix decided to just focus on producing a full-on 3D remake of Final Fantasy III that could leverage the technical capabilities of Nintendo's upcoming console, the Nintendo DS. And upon launch, the Final Fantasy III Remake proved that a 3D remake of an old Final Fantasy game could not only succeed, but do so in spades. And due to how well it had been done, and the nature of the game that had served as the benchmark, production for a remake of Final Fantasy IV started with immediate haste. After the release of the Final Fantasy IV Remake, many fans assumed that Square and Matrix Software would turn their attention towards producing similar remakes for Final Fantasy V and VI. 
But when everyone reconvened, they had a rather different idea about what their next foray on the Nintendo DS should be. Instead of continuing to dive into the past and attempting to modernise an older game, there was a belief that the knowledge gained from working on the two remakes could be applied to create something original, a first true Final Fantasy spin-off in what had been a considerable period of time. It led to Square Enix facing something of a quandary. On the one hand, they wanted to reward Tomoe Asano and Takashi Tokita for their efforts in producing the Final Fantasy 3 and 4 remakes. But on the other hand, they would be leaving money on the table by not remaking Final Fantasy 5 and 6. They therefore decided to try and do both. But even though Asano and Tokita were able to fulfill their objective of producing Final Fantasy The Four Heroes of Light, Square Enix were unable to fulfill theirs. Matrix Software was a very handy development partner, and they were the ideal partner to work on the Final Fantasy V and VI remakes. But with them occupied by Asano, Square Enix attempted to recreate the output themselves, and struggled. In 2010, a year after the Four Heroes of Light released, it led to Shinji Hashimoto addressing everything that was happening by saying that even though they had explored remaking V and VI, they had encountered technical issues. Hashimoto therefore suggested that fans shouldn't get their hopes up. He then though clarified this statement a few months later, saying that due to how much time had passed, Square Enix were now considering a different approach. He noted that rather than creating a 5 and 6 remake for the current DS, what we want to do is look at how the 3DS evolves, and then make a decision. But after this, the notion of remaking 5 and 6 was completely swept under the carpet. Now during the earlier years of the franchise, in what we might call the Sakaguchi era, there was a cardinal rule that games had to remain standalone. Sequels and spin-offs were allowed, but they needed to exist within supporting mediums such as novels and OVAs. This rule was pretty firm, but it wasn't necessarily a rule that everyone agreed with, as Yoshinori Kitase was always exploring ways to expand the properties that he was involved with. And in one particular case, this could have seen the development of a Final Fantasy VI spin-off that was focused around city building. This revelation came via a passing comment Kitaze made as he was reminiscing about Final Fantasy VI as part of its 25th anniversary. Kitaze shared that the concept would have been based around Strago cultivating a village, stating that it would have been similar to Sim City, just on a smaller scale. It sounded rather fascinating as a concept. But even though initial planning was done, development was cancelled due to scheduling issues. The idea of a city-building Final Fantasy title then actually resurfaced much later. In the year 2000, Square released a game called Working Chocobo for the Wonderswan. It was a life simulator where players raised chocobos and worked alongside them to cultivate their land and earn items. Perhaps the Final Fantasy VI city builder would have shared some of the framework of this particular game. However, it's uncertain what the reception would have been like, as Working Chocobo unfortunately only sold around 9,000 copies in its lifetime. Final Fantasy IV has a rather complicated development story, and if you'd like to find out the full, rather detailed version, then please check out the complete history of Final Fantasy IV, which we've linked to in the description below. For now though, here's the abbreviated version. Throughout the development of Final Fantasy III, there was a degree of flux in the market, as Nintendo were preparing to launch their next major console. It just kept suffering from significant delays. Towards the end of 1989, when decisions were being made around the next generation of Final Fantasy software, the marketing and sales department therefore pushed for the franchise to appeal to a broader demographic, using their industry research to support their case. They knew that such an objective always had the potential to be challenging, as there was a risk of alienating existing fans in the pursuit of new ones, but for the franchise to continue to grow and thrive, they felt it was a necessary step to take, especially as the Super Famicom itself had the potential to attract a new audience. They therefore used their growing influence to push for a forward-thinking plan that initially enabled them to cater to both old and new audiences at the same time as this meant they planned to produce Final Fantasy IV for the Famicom and Final Fantasy V for the Super Famicom, with the same development team working on both games simultaneously. In the first few months of this plan, everything seemed to be working. 
by November 1990, vertical slices for both games had been produced, and between then and the end of the year, they were shown off to the sales and public relations departments, but also the rest of the company. The idea was to gain feedback from a wider audience so that revisions could be made sooner rather than later, or if need be, the projects could be taken back to the drawing board. But feedback on both projects was positive. Both games had strong mechanics and storylines. However, question marks started to be raised around the proposed release schedule, as Final Fantasy V was actually announced before Final Fantasy IV and they intended to release them out of sequence. In the end, it was decided that such a decision had the potential to negatively impact the brand. The reality was that Final Fantasy V had been developed with a very clear objective of surpassing Final Fantasy IV in every conceivable way. But with it planned to release second, the fear was that when it did eventually go to market, it would look incredibly poor by comparison. This led to Square issuing a statement to the public. They were forced to explain the cancellation of Final Fantasy IV on the Famicom and the subsequent rebranding of Final Fantasy V as Final Fantasy IV. And in interviews that took place in and around the cancellation, Sakaguchi tried to do some damage limitation by stating that not much work was ever done on the Famicom version and that it barely made it out of the concepting phase. But many years later, the subject was revisited and Sakaguchi shared that he had actually lied in those initial interviews because he was embarrassed and wanted to save face. The game was actually around 80% complete when the decision was taken to cancel it. Now, we've spoken about the cancellation of remakes of Final Fantasy V and VI, but remakes of Final Fantasy VII, VIII, and IX were also announced and then cancelled. Back in 2001, just over six months after Final Fantasy IX had been released in Japan, and before the games had even shipped to Europe, Square Enix announced that they were working on a trilogy of remakes. And this announcement was completely out of left field, not least because the games weren't even that old at that point. According to the press release, Final Fantasy VII, VIII, and IX were planned to be remade for the PlayStation 2, with each game taking advantage of the additional space offered by the new DVD format, which in turn was meant to allow for graphical and audio enhancements. This suggested that the remakes would have been more limited in scope than the full ground-up reimagining of Final Fantasy VII that ended up releasing on the PlayStation 4 it was more likely that this trio of remakes would have been more similar to Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age, serving as a soft update to the original game, with improved presentation and perhaps some enhanced or adjusted mechanics. What's strange, however, was that after the announcement, nothing was ever heard about the projects again, and they were quietly cancelled. It's never been revealed what happened, but the most logical reason for their cancellation relates to what was happening at the time. Square was, of course, going through a rather tumultuous period, and with Yuichi Wada taking the helm, he must have felt that resources could have been better spent elsewhere to help turn around the fortunes of the ailing company. Speaking of Yuichi Wada, there was a period of time in Square Enix's history where they focused on building games that were planned to live in a shared universe called Fabula Nova Crystallis. When it was announced, this shared universe was planned to include Final Fantasy XIII, Final Fantasy vs XIII, and Final Fantasy Agato XIII. Agato XIII was originally announced exclusively for mobile devices designed as a sort of successor to Before Crisis. However, what wasn't revealed was that the PlayStation Portable version was also planned. This news became public in 2008, and what followed was the quiet cancellation of the mobile version. By 2011, almost six years after the game's announcement, no further update had been given, and Yosuke Naura, who had worked on Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VII and VIII and Vagrant Story, went on record as saying he had never worked on a single game for such a long period of time. Later that year, it was revealed that Agato 13 had actually been rebranded to Final Fantasy Type-0, as once pre-production had started, they ended up making wholesale changes to almost the entire concept. This meant that even though they retained some elements of the shared mythology with Fabulous Nova Crystallis, the wider connection with Final Fantasy 13 was removed, and this led to the Fabulous Nova Crystallis logo even being changed. 
Type 0 ended up launching later that year, and it turned out to be a huge success. It scored 39 out of 40 with Famitsu, and ended up as the ninth best-selling PSP game to ever launch in Japan. The success of Type-0 saw the team explore how they could build out the universe, and instead of coming up with something original, they just reverted back to the concept that had been announced back in 2006, which was Agato 13, an episodic mobile game with elements linked to real-world day-night cycles. Agato then released in May 2014, but even though it had a very high initial player base, it came with a number of issues that impacted the player gameplay experience, such as long load times, imperfect controls, and other gameplay inconveniences. Still, countless episodes were released, and as phase one of its story concluded, Square Enix announced that Final Fantasy Agato Plus, a, a more substantial version of the game, was in development for the PlayStation Vita. With Agato Plus designed to fix many of the grievances of the mobile game, the announcement was positively received. After all, many of the game's problems related to performance as opposed to the actual content. However, the project went through a troubled development cycle. In the end, the development team encountered an unprecedented amount of technical problems with the port, and it was announced in May 2015 that they had encountered a bug they actually couldn't fix and they were waiting for specialists at PlayStation to help them out. But as the game was then cancelled, around a year after it was announced, the assumption is that the bug was so drastic that there was no viable fix. But Agato Plus wasn't the only cancelled game relating to this specific subseries. There was, of course, the planned localization of Type-0 for the PlayStation Portable that never saw the light of day, with numerous voice actors talking about recording lines back in 2012. Square Enix also announced that Final Fantasy Agato was to be localized, only to then quietly pretend such an announcement never happened when the Japanese version of the game was shut down following the conclusion of its second phase. They also stated that Agato was to be ported to Windows 10, but that also never materialized. But that's not all, as a much bigger property relating to the type franchise was teased and then never saw the light of day. Despite being part of the Fabio Nova Crystallis franchise, Type-0 was very much intended to be its own thing, and there was a long-term plan to create a much broader series as shown by Type-1, Type-2, and Type-3 all being trademarked. Hype for a follow-up to Type-0 began almost as soon as the game was released, but it wasn't until people saw the post credit scene in Final Fantasy Type-0 HD that fans had something to latch onto. This was then further built upon when the team shared concept art for a future installment in the Type series at a PlayStation event in Hong Kong. Hajime Tabata, the director of Type Zero, revealed that as the sub-franchise expanded, each entry was intended to focus on a different audience, with it being something of an antithesis to the wider franchise. This meant that the process of innovation was to be maintained with a new world and setting. But whereas mainline Final Fantasy games always created an original cast of characters, unless they were direct sequels, Type 1 was to feature the exact same cast, just in an unconnected way. This harkened back to Sakaguchi's vision for Aki Ross from The Spirits Within, as she was meant to be treated like an actor as opposed to a character, able to play multiple roles irrespective of the medium or the genre. To that end, Class Zero was to star in Type 1, which was to be a very different type of game to Type Zero, featuring a more adult and mature theme. If the project was successful, and the team continued to produce Type 2, then this was to be developed with a younger audience in mind. Similar to Type 1, which was cancelled early on in its concepting phase, Type 2 was cancelled before any meaningful work was done and with Tabata leaving the company and Luminous Productions now dissolved, it feels like there's almost no chance for a revival. But that then brings us on to another project that has never seen the light of day for almost the exact same reason. Final Fantasy XV had one of the most infamous development cycles in video gaming history. After starting out as Versus 13, the project regularly changed hands, and even though it was eventually released in 2016, it was a sense it remained unfinished. Determined to right the wrongs, even though there were no initial plans, the development team turned Final Fantasy XV into a game as a service, providing regular patches and free content expansions to address issues such as completely reworking Chapter 13. And in general, they tried to make 15 a better experience overall, 
Alongside this, the team also developed standalone expansions called episodes. Each episode was devoted to a specific character, and they were intended to expand upon and paint a more complete picture for each character's story. The initial wave was Episode Gladiolus, Episode Prompto, and Episode Ignis, with Comrades releasing as a multiplayer expansion. With each release, the quality improved, and by the time Episode Ignis launched, there was enough positive sentiment for the development team to tease what was next. This meant, in a very unexpected move, they launched a huge survey asking fans what they wanted to see from Final Fantasy XV. And when the results were revealed, Tabata and Business Division 2 put their money where their mouth was, by announcing a second season pass full of downloadable content that was planned to expand on the stories of Arden, Aranea, Lunafreya, and Noctis. However, of the planned second season pass, only episode Arden was ever released. Despite the full details of each episode not being known, each came with a specific title that hinted at what could have been. Episode Aranea was titled The Beginning of the End. Episode Luna Freya was titled The Choice of Freedom. And Episode Noctis was titled The Final Strike. Unfortunately, the remaining three episodes were cancelled when Tabata, who was the project lead at the time, suddenly left Square Enix. To try and save face, the unreleased episodes were then reworked into a novel called The Dawn of the Future, which was penned by Emi Nagashima. Now, as mentioned, throughout its first two years, Final Fantasy XV received countless updates, but it also received plenty of other supporting properties too, such as a VR fishing game called Monster of the Deep. But there was also another VR experience announced that never ended up seeing the light of day. Originally, the Final Fantasy XV VR experience was supposed to be centered around Prompto, and it was announced that E3 2016 will also be playable on the show floor. But the immediate feedback was quite damning. The Verge described it as not very Final Fantasy, while Polygon described it as a mess, and Kotaku said it was flat out terrible. The premise of the demo was that the player took control of Prompto, first person in the fight against Deadeye from Episode to Sky. You had to shoot Deadeye while your compatriots went in with melee attacks, and if he charged you, you had to move out of the way. In summary, it was a pretty simple game, akin to many light gun games of the past. The initial plan was for the VR experience to release later that year, with VG247 even stating that it was due to release on the 30th of September. However, due to feedback, the team decided to not move forward with this concept. They felt that fixing the game to make it more compelling would have taken too much time and effort, and they also ended up drawing the same conclusion after briefly entertaining the idea of making another VR game centered around other party members and their core mechanics. It was for this reason that the team ultimately went with producing something much more manageable, a fishing game. As video game development entered into the high definition era, Square Enix sent numerous delegates of developers to Western studios so they could learn how they were adapting to the change. On one such trip, a Square Enix delegation visited a Scandinavian developer called Grin, and having been impressed, they were invited to come over to Japan to pitch their vision for how they would create a new game in the rather obscure Lord of Vermilion franchise. After arriving, Grin found out the goalposts had moved. Instead of Lord of Vermilion, Square Enix were wanting to understand how a Western studio would handle creating a AAA game based in the world of Ivalice, something that led to the birth of a project called Fortress. Having been fans of Ivalice themselves, many of the people at Grin wanted to create a true successor to Final Fantasy XII, with Bosch planned to serve as the main protagonist in their vision. And the narrative was to then be based around his quest to defeat Lomond the Sea King, an entity that rose every 10,000 years to seek revenge against Ash's ancestors. Extensive planning was undertaken, and tons of concept art and assets were produced, but even though such extensive planning was undertaken, the game unfortunately never came to fruition. According to one of Grin's founders, Ulf Anderson, he was aware that Square Enix were testing the waters, and one of the main complications was around disagreements over the game's art style. Even though they had asked Grin to propose their vision, Square Enix were unhappy with how much it deviated from what they themselves would have produced if they were making the game. The Japanese arm felt that Grin had taken things too far by focusing on a Nordic aesthetic, 
This feedback led to Grin scrapping numerous concepts and going back essentially to the drawing board, something that led to some serious crunch as Square Enix decided to not extend agreed upon deadlines. The situation then became more difficult following the acquisition of Eidos Interactive. Prior to the purchase, Grin were liaising with Square Enix Japan directly. But after, all communications had to be filtered through Square Enix's new UK office, which was made up of IDOS Interactive employees. But the only challenge was that those employees also had their own opinions. This led to more delays due to nothing more than miscommunication. And with the project not progressing as intended, Square Enix ultimately pulled funding and Fortress never saw the light of day. Another Evilies property, Final Fantasy Tactics, is a game beloved by fans for providing players with in-depth tactical role-playing gameplay coupled with a brutal and compelling story. Due to the project's success, Sakaguchi then sought to further broaden the horizons of Evilies, and this was to be provided in the form of a sequel that was tentatively dubbed Final Fantasy Tactics 2. According to revealed design documents, Tactics 2 was planned to do away with the original isometric gameplay system, instead focusing on a 2D hexagonal grid system. Jobs would have continued to be an important aspect of the game, but some of the screenshots and bits of information surrounding the title suggested that showdowns between individual characters would have been given greater focus amongst the grander scheme of events within the game. Even though the project was ambitious, it was unfortunately unable to pan out. From its inception, the game's development was plagued with difficulties. At the time, there was a push for game sequels to release closer together to ride the momentum of the first game's popularity and success. But the key staff responsible for the success of the original game, such as Matsuno and Ito, and their respective development teams were too busy with other projects like Vagrant Story and Final Fantasy IX. Square had considered waiting for Matsuno to finish Vagrant Story so that he could lead Tactics 2, but instead opted to outsource development so they didn't lose time. Although much is not publicly known about the full reason for the project being cancelled, there was apparently a large number of challenges that resulted in the project's completion becoming unfeasible, and part of this was likely because of Sakaguchi's then increased involvement in Final Fantasy IX and The Spirits Within. Later on, Matsuno did attempt to take charge of Tactics 2 at Sakaguchi's request, but balancing this hefty task alongside development of Vagrant Story proved to be too difficult. This, along with a multitude of other behind-the-scenes issues, essentially impeded any further progress on the game's development, and as a result, the project met an early and unfortunate demise. After this, the Tactics series did see further installments though, via Tactics Advance and Tactics A2, but fans have often called for a more direct sequel to the original Tactics game. That then brings us onto a statement from Naoki Yoshida, who said he believed that it was about time for a new entry in the Tactics franchise, which has revived hope amongst some fans for some kind of Tactics revival. But although Yoshida's statement means there is a chance for Square Enix to refresh interest in the Tactics series, the company hasn't always had the best track record with rebooting interest in older games, such as their failed attempt to relaunch Final Fantasy XI. To commemorate Final Fantasy XI's long run and loyal player base, Square Enix decided to go big on what at the time was supposed to be the game's last scenario expansion, Rhapsodies of Vanadiel. This gave rise to the Vanadiel project. But as the decision had been taken to sunset the PlayStation 2 and Xbox 360 versions of the game, Square Enix decided it would be smart to focus on the ever-growing mobile gaming scene. Thus, alongside the new chapter, they announced the Final Fantasy XI mobile project. The mobile project consisted of two titles. One of these was called Grandmasters, an exclusive role-playing game for phones. But it was perhaps the other game that garnered more interest and attention, as it was an adapted version of Final Fantasy XI itself. This ambitious project, which was revealed under the provisional title of Final Fantasy XI-R, short for Final Fantasy XI Reboot, was interestingly dubbed an MMMRPG which stood for Massively Multiplayer Mobile Role-Playing Game. To execute their plans, Square Enix partnered with a Korean gaming company called Nexon, with whom they already had a working relationship, thanks to the Korean server of Final Fantasy XIV. And as the name and project suggested, this was an effort to effectively deliver the complete Final Fantasy XI experience on mobile devices. 
To achieve this, gameplay had to be adapted considerably. This included the incorporation of a touch-based interface as well as a faster-paced battle system to complement the medium's convenience factor. The development team also sought to seamlessly implement the MMO's original story as well as create a graphically enhanced version via Unreal Engine 4. They also wanted to make solo gameplay more viable while still retaining the community-centric feel of the original game. The initial plan was for the game to launch in 2016, however things didn't go to that plan. During the Nexon developer conference in April 2016, some screenshots of a redesigned Windurst and Saruta Baruta were revealed to the public, but nothing else was shared. We then had the opportunity to speak to Yoshida at the end of 2017 to ask what was happening behind the scenes. He insisted that the game was still in development, something that was verified by Nexon continuing to hire staff for the project. In 2018, it was then revealed that production was being handled by Nexon One Studio, but instead of being a complete replica of the original game, just on mobile, it had been transformed into an RPG trading card game that was renamed as Final Fantasy XI Mobile. More silence then followed until screenshots leaked in early 2020, but later in the year, Nexon revealed that the game had been cancelled, with a difference of opinion between Square Enix and Nexon over the game's vision and direction cited as the main reason. That then brings us on to the most well-known cancel game associated with Final Fantasy, Versus 13. As mentioned earlier, Versus 13 was meant to be part of the Fabulous Nova Crystallis sub-franchise, and as such, it was very much intended to be a spin-off game that leveraged the same mythology as Final Fantasy 13 and Agate 13. Each game was to be overseen by a different director, with Motomo Toriyama overseeing the main project, having done a successful job with Final Fantasy X-2, and Hajime Tabata looking after Agato 13, having turned Before Crisis into a cash cow. Versus 13 was then to be directed by Tetsuya Nomura, with the Kingdom Hearts team overseeing development. The team's trademark dramatic flair was evident in the game's first trailer, which premiered at E3 2006. It showcased a world that was stylistically very different from Final Fantasy XIII, with the juxtaposition between light and dark, clear as day, and the whole aesthetic and premise resonated with expectant audiences. This led to a ton of interest around the game, and that interest continued to be sustained despite the road to release being plagued with a myriad of issues. By 2011, five years after its announcement, the general public was still none the wiser about what was happening, this was further emphasised when I actually asked Katase about it point blank when I had the chance to speak to him at Gamescom. Out of nothing more than hope, I asked whether Versus 13 was planned to release in 2011, and in reply Katase said, We have no release date information to update, unfortunately we can't say anything about that. We can't commit ourselves to 2011 either. Interestingly though, was that even back then, there were theories that due to its slow progress, it may end up becoming Final Fantasy XV. In the comments of my news story back in 2010, Destructo888 predicted this by saying, I'm betting the next Versus trailer we'll see will end with the title Final Fantasy XV. Either that, or it won't even have the Final Fantasy name. Fast forward three years, and that's exactly what happened, as a new Versus 13 trailer was shown, only for the logo to update to Final Fantasy XV. However, this change had been coming for a long time. Under Nomura, Versus 13 had made slow but consistent progress. Due to his skill set, Nomura was tasked with aiding on numerous projects at the same time, and the same was asked of the Kingdom Hearts development team too. As Final Fantasy 13 encountered problems, resources were reallocated, and other projects just became more important, such as the creation of Kingdom Hearts spin-offs and Final Fantasy 7 spin-offs there started to become an appreciation that things couldn't continue in this manner, and it led to some harsh decisions being made as senior figures decided whether Versus 13 should just be cancelled, especially as an entirely new console generation had now entered into the equation. After nearly six years of constant delays and obstacles, in 2012 the project switched to development for the next generation of consoles, and this resulted in its biggest change, as Versus 13 was internally rebranded to Final Fantasy XV. After its rebranding, the game experienced quite the overhaul, and much of this was overseen by Hajime Tabata, who after completing Type-0 was assigned as co-director, with much of his team joining the development staff. 
Tabata then ended up replacing Nomura as the main director, and he was given the interesting task of not just delivering the game to market within three years, but getting gamers excited about a project that was now over six years old and was going to be morphed into something that was similar, but also very different from the proposed vision. This saw characters like Stella Knox Florey completely cut, and the wider scenario was adapted to suit this new vision. Large parts were also removed from the game, transitioned into supporting content such as Kingsglaive or DLC episodes, so that they could manufacture more development time for themselves. It's unclear how much truth there is, but numerous rumours ended up being posted that suggested Versus 13 was planned to be an epic trilogy of games, with characters such as Glauca, Claris, Ravus and Idolus given much more time to develop. And given how surgical the story changes were, this does make a degree of sense, as by condensing three games into one, there are bound to be some challenges. What's interesting, however, is that Versus 13 may be gone, but it hasn't been forgotten, with Nomura constantly teasing numerous concepts relating to Versus 13 within Kingdom Hearts 3. And in the most obvious of these, a curious storyline has been embedded within the game via Viram Rex. The main character of Viram Rex, Yuzora, bears an eerie resemblance to Noctis. And what's more, there's a scene of Yuzora waking up inside a moving car, which is nearly identical to the iconic scene of Noctis waking up in his car in the 2011 vs 13 trailer. That though, concludes our journey. Thank you so much for watching everyone. My name is Daryl and this has been every known cancelled game that we've been able to find out about over the years. Hopefully, as you watch through, you've gained an appreciation for why some projects ended up being cancelled, but also a curiosity for what could have been if some of these games had actually ended up releasing. If you did enjoy learning about the games though, please consider showing us how much you appreciate the effort that's put into researching, writing and editing this kind of video by giving it a like. Any interactions you make really do help the channel out, so if you do genuinely like this content, please let us know in the comments. I've definitely seen a swell of people saying how much they prefer our longer form videos, so hopefully this scratched the itch. If you're still listening though, I'd like to ask that if you'd like to continue seeing the channel flourish, then we genuinely appreciate any support you can give us on Patreon. We are incredibly fortunate to receive the support of Benjamin Snow, CloudClone28, the livestream, Gregory, Justin Dent and Zukun TDK or Super Special Onion Knights, and all the other people whose names you're seeing right now. Without them, the channel would be nigh impossible to maintain in its current form. You can help fund the channel for as little as $3 per month, and this gets you access to perks such as videos early when we can, free from advertising, audio-only versions of our super long form content, and voting rights to help us determine our next major project. All right, everyone, this is Daryl signing out. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.